Everybody, how's it going? Dan Schender here on Drumming Injury Talk with Dr. Nadia on Drum Talk TV. Hi, Nadia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing great. And this is brought to you, folks, by the Metaflex Therapy Glove. Great for musicians if you have issues with arthritis, bursitis, circulation, grip strength, all kinds of things like that, carpal tunnel. So get yourself a pair of these. There are still discounts running, I believe, and the link is in the post. If you folks have any sort of repetitive motion injuries related to drumming or even guitar playing or, or playing any instrument, go ahead and chime in and let us know what have you struggled with? What's affecting you now? How have you gotten past something? How are you avoiding it? Because there's so many ways that you can do that. And we're going to talk about some of that stuff. When I look over here, I am not watching Mayberry. I'm watching your comments so that I can relay them to Nadia and she'll see them on her side as well. So let us know where you're watching from and what issues you have. Have you talked to anyone recently, Nadia, since our last show that have some interesting things going on with their hands, their shoulders, their back, their knees, anything at all from their posture, hitting too hard, you know, all the things we talk about on the show. Yeah, no, I actually, nothing that comes to mind is like something that really stood out. Um, I was just at PASIC last week, as, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, had a few conversations with people about, you know, oh, I've had a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, but largely the same kinds of things that, that we've always talked about, you know, some trouble with the hands or some shoulder issues or uh, some back pain, some things like that. Um, but no nothing, nothing super unique uh, that I can that I can think of at the moment that came up. Have you ever spoken to folks that are more on the drum core side of things that are carrying drums, but also are hitting a harder, tighter surface typically than most drummers that play drum set? Yeah, um, I haven't spoken to them uh, specifically. My work has been like largely focused on drum set. Yeah. Um, but there, there may be an opportunity for me to branch out a bit into more percussion, like uh, concert percussion, orchestral percussion oh. in the next year or two. I talk about that another time. But um, I don't know a whole lot about marching band or I haven't spoken to people directly. I do know that uh, DCI, they have uh, like strength and conditioning mm -hmm. coaches and physical therapists. I think in particular, the physical therapists who actually go out with them like on tour because of the absolutely really? grueling demands. Oh, yeah. Like that's, during competition season, yeah. I think that says yeah. something right there, right? It does. I mean, their their training schedule is unbelievable. It's literally like all day long. Yeah. Um, and, and their sticks are a lot such, bigger, and they're probably yeah. and they're hitting a harder surface, whether it's tenors or snares or whatever. So I could see how there'd be a whole other layer of things going on there, especially with that yeah. grueling type of workout. Totally. And I would imagine more uh, back issues as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know. This is me spitballing. I don't know that for a fact, but I would think, I mean, even though they have the harnesses for carrying the drums and stuff, I mean, those things weigh a yeah. ton. Yeah. And when you're effectively like, when you have the choreography in with all of that and you're doing these very precise <laughs> movements and following all... You know, it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot of strain. I think they also tend to see a lot more foot issues, foot and ankle injuries as well, for oh. the same reason. Like, they're, they're, you know, your your ankles bear the load of your entire body and anything else that you put on it. So, yeah. um, you know, that puts a lot of stress on on the joints of the feet and ankles for sure, and knees. So that makes sense. I'm mm -hmm. gonna refresh my screen and. See who's chiming in, if anybody, and we sure hope you are. And feel free to ask questions. Well, we've got Dr. Nadia here. Um, and again, tell us where you're watching from. So for those who don't know, I've suffered a bit from not just some arthritis, which is getting a lot better, but also um, nerve damage. There's times where I need my wife to open like a, a tear open plastic thing there's been times where it's been difficult to even peel apart a Ziploc because I just don't have the agility. It's been really weird to be so young and be in that position where I got to hand it to my wife. Here, will you please open this for me? I can't quite get it done. 
you know, mm -hmm. but um, I know that all of it is from, I've been playing, April will be 53 years. And there were 20 whatever years of that or 30 of playing very, 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 very regularly. And mm -hmm. probably half of that time playing a lot harder than I really should have been. And that same amount of time playing on a set that was not set up for my physiotype. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I sat high, I had drums that were high, I had cymbals that were far. If any of you have seen my big blue kit, it's actually bigger than what you've ever seen. It used to be set up quite differently. In fact, let me grab a picture and show you all because that leads us to a topic that we talk about a lot on here. Yeah, at least to, so now if you folks look at my setup, my, my <clears throat> toms that are right in front of me are like at mid chest level. Whereas look how they look in this picture. You see how high everything is? Mm -hmm. I'm sitting way up high. I mean, even the mount on the bass drum is very high. I've got three giant floor toms to my right. Um, uh, the 16 is the one on top. And then on the bottom, I got an 18 and a 20. And everything was tilted. And these toms that are... What side am I on? Here we go. These toms here were quite high going all the way around. And my snare drum oh, okay. was high and tilted. Just a whole different setup and a whole different ergonomics and therefore a whole different way of playing. I haven't grown since then. I haven't shrunk either. My Well, maybe a little bit. But I mean, my reach was not really what's the word suited for that setup. So mm -hmm. a lot of injuries that Nadia has come across. And when we get comments on the show, a lot of times it comes down to things being set up too far, too high. And, and we talk about this all the time. The biggest, unless you're Rick Wakeman with his giant keyboard rig of 14 mm -hmm. keyboards, the drums are the biggest piece of scenery on a set as far as the instruments. And sometimes for a show, we put big chinas up here or, you know, all, all these things so that from afar, it, it looks cool, but it's not always the healthiest thing to go from the snare to a china way up here and go, rah, rah, rah. you know, I probably shouldn't have been doing that to demonstrate it. <laughs> and it has nothing, to, it has little to do with how great a shape you're in. It's still the extension, the stretch, the yeah. speed, and then you're impacting something. So talk about that, Nadia. There's a lot of different elements going into that. Yeah, and and... Yes, you're right. It it doesn't really matter how good of shape you're in. Um, it certainly being in good physical condition can help prevent injuries because your muscles are stronger, uh, they're more efficient. They um, oh, I had something in mind and then it just whoop, slipped right out. Um, <laughs> you they can hold. They don't fatigue as quickly. That's what it is. They uh. are. They have better endurance, um, and so you your postural muscles can do their job for a longer period of time things like that so it can certainly help reduce your risk of injury but being you know in great physical condition doesn't mean you'll never get an injury especially if your drum set is set up like we talked about because you're yeah. right you know when you're reaching to the extremes of your range of motion um that puts a lot of stress and on you're your usually joints. not doing it like that <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, so you're not rapid. like gently dabbing the symbol <laughs> out there. Like you're smashing it. You're putting a lot of force through joints that are already in an extreme position that puts a lot of stress on them just by reaching. Um, so that that is a lot um, for those tissues to take. And over time, you know, and I mean, over time, it could be years before you know, it really becomes a problem, yeah. but it does take a toll. And so certainly being in good physical condition will help. It might prolong that. It might keep it from being a problem for a longer period, but eventually it will catch up with you. And, um, you know, we, we've talked before about the different drummers that uh, uh, Vinny Apice and Carmine a piece. Um, I did say they're, that is how they, I know yeah. they're pronounced them differently. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> both of them had the same injury, the same shoulder, like rotator cuff issue. 
um, that they ended up having to have surgery for and they attribute it to like having their symbols way out here for so long and they eventually you know brought everything in to put less strain on their joints um but yeah i think i think it was carmine described to me it actually like the shoulder blowing during a show yeah where it was like i think he maybe it wasn't in the middle of a drum solo but it was definitely on stage and it just went he lit, caught his earlier yeah. and just went and he had to finish the show but then like that was you know he needed surgery to fix it Vinny yeah. caught his before it became that <laughs> big of an right. issue um but uh yeah so it certainly can catch up with you um uh, after a while definitely and how how much does or does not proper hydration feed into the likelihood of injuries you know if you're not hydrated and you're doing something athletic this is basically what that is. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's definitely athletic. Um, so hydration is very important, especially for, um, you know, keeping your fluids up for your, your blood, uh, blood volume up so that your heart doesn't have to work as hard to pump blood through your body, that sort of thing. Um, so hydration, does it have a direct effect on injury? Probably not a direct, like the more water you drink, the less likely you are to get hurt, but it, it plays into your body's ability to meet physical demands. Okay. Um, so when, uh, when your demand, the demands on your tissues or your body are up here, but your capacity or sorry, other way around demands are here, but capacity is here. There's no issue. But as you fatigue, as you don't hydrate, as you're, you know, other risk factors come into play, that gap between demands and capacity narrows until eventually you're meeting it and then eventually demands exceed capacity and that's when an injury happens. Um, so yeah, hydration is certainly important for overall physiology in, in being able to play the instrument and meet those demands. Can you please tell especially for the drummers out in Queens, that whiskey and bourbon is not considered hydration. It is not, unfortunately. <laughs> Neither is beer. <laughs> That's right. It, you know, a Neither lot of coffee. people actually think it is. It's all water. It's, it's not hydration if it's got alcohol no. in it. No, yeah. no, because it's any water that's in there is being counteracted by the effect of the alcohol. Yeah. Um, and same with coffee. The caffeine in it is, you know. How about orange juice with the acidity? Works. Same thing. Uh, it's probably, I don't think the acidity next necessarily works against you. Generally speaking, when we talk about hydration, we are talking about water. Yeah. Um, you know, now you can get hydration obviously from fruits and vegetables. Like they have, you know, cucumbers, watermelon, apples, oranges. Yeah. Um, but that's not enough. Like for the amount that you'd have to eat in fruits and vegetables to get the hydration level that you actually need is not reasonable. So right. Um, water is definitely the, the way to go. Great. Uh, let's see if we've got any questions, suggestions, anything. Kevin, let me take this with me. Got to get closer. So Kevin McGurvigan says, Neil Peart and tendonitis, I believe, hitting the drums so damn hard. Yeah, he did have issues and... Uh, there's so many things that can come into play. What could contribute to tendonitis? Mm -hmm. Could it be all those things? Could it be how you play, how you grip? I'm sorry, how hard you play, how you grip, and how your setup is? Could it be a combination of all those things? Yeah, so uh, tendonitis happens. Um, some of the risk factors are putting like high forces through those tendons. So that can be like really intense muscle contractions, um, in, also including the impact, not so much from the, the link between tendonitis and vibration isn't as strong. Um, but the, the force of like having to resist, um, or that, that impact and create the motion to generate that impact is high force. And so that's putting a lot of force through your tendons, which can cause strain on them. The other thing too is repetition. So repetitive movements, mm. whether that's repetition at the wrist or repetitive shoulder movements. Um, that again, especially in combination with high force. So like all these risk factors kind of compound each other, right? And you rarely get one in isolation. Right. You're almost always getting like high force with a weird posture or repeatedly moving into awkward postures or something like that. They're almost always combined. Um, but repetition is definitely an issue. Um, those, those repetitive motions, 
um, I mean, your, your body is so streamlined. Everything is sort of like in its place and, and it has a very narrow margin of where it can move. And so if you're moving your arm, um, the arm is a good one, good example for bicep tendonitis. It starts to rub against the bones that Ugh. meet up in your shoulder and it can create the friction in there, can create inf inflammation. You can start getting fraying tendons. Um, wow. And then high force can contribute to issues of inflammation and, and irritation in the tendon as well. Interesting. And is repetitive motion injuries, repet is repetitive motion, repetitive motion, or how do I ask this? Or if repetitive motion A is more constant versus that same amount of repetitive motion mixed in with other repetitive motion, does that break up the mm -hmm. likelihood or, or not? Is it, if it's the present, it makes you susceptible as, uh, just as much. I mean, certainly if it's, if it's present, it makes you susceptible. Um, but the amount of rest that you're incorporating in there can help offset the effects. And of rest could even be a things, different really. motion in different percentages rest can mixed even, in. Absolutely. Now, if you're, um, you know, if, if you're doing this wrist motion and you switch to this wrist motion, you're still straining the wrist. Yeah. So it's, it's probably not gonna have as much of, a, of an effect. Um, but you know, if you're working on your, your hands, like your rudiments or whatever, and then you switch to doing that with footwork, you're still playing, but your hands are getting a rest while mm -hmm. your feet are working and vice versa. Um, and then, uh, you know, having enough time completely off the kit every day is important to give your muscles a complete rest from doing that particular motion and give them time to recover as well. Very cool. Thank you. And... I don't know how well you folks can hear when I pull back. Um, <laughs> my wife keeps saying, no farther. I can still hear you, really. No farther. <laughs> uh, Eric John Gambardella says, is there a strong link between trigger finger and drumming? Oh, before you answer, Nadia, I'd like to comment um, to Eric that I had really bad trigger finger coincidentally in both my ring fingers so badly it would get locked and i'd have to open it and my doctor said i know nadia you know what what causes it that it was from nodules on the tendons and whether or not that was from drumming or diet i i don't know or some people being more mm -hmm. susceptible to it but w what is your answer to eric's question about trigger finger being tied to drumming possibly so I haven't come across that in, in my work. The two biggest uh, injuries that were reported were tendonitis and carpal tunnel syndrome. And for those and who don't trigger... know, Nadia has done a lot of research on this for about four years now. A lot of people yeah. participating in you know questionnaires and very extensive research. So it's not like she's worked with five drummers to see what's wrong with them. It's been more like five or 600. Yeah, I think well, the survey um, where I got this data that I'm, I was just talking about had uh, 830. Wow. Actually, it was over 850, but only oh, 830 right. were usable. Yeah. Um, that's somewhere a like high half the ratio, stuff. though. Oh, it's a huge. That's a huge, uh, yeah. huge response. So yeah, I was really happy with that. Um, but yeah, that that's what came up is, is those two and trigger finger. I, I don't believe is considered a form of tendonitis because it's not, those nodules are not the same thing as swollen tendons. Nodules right. are specific, like hardened uh, little nodes in your tendon, whereas yeah. tendonitis is an inflammation of the tendon itself. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's different. Um, so I haven't seen a link between those two. Does that mean a drummer couldn't develop trigger finger from playing? No, it's just, I'm sure they could, but that's just not something that has come up significant, like often enough in my uh, work for me to think that there's a strong link between the yeah. two. Interesting. Thanks for the question, mm -hmm. Eric and Nadia for the answer. Okay. And I know this is something we, and for those of you who are wondering like, well, okay, so you mentioned this is something we talk about all the time. Why do we talk about it all the time? Because not everyone sees the same episodes and everything. And there's some things that we always have to be reminded of. 
You know, I see so many mm-hmm. drummers doing so many different stretches in so many different ways at different points of their playing before, during, after, in between a song while the guitar players are noodling and tuning. And eh, what, What's proper stretching dynamic for systatic and when should which one be done? Yeah, so the, uh, the general recommendation is that dynamic stretching is done as part of your warm-up. So if you think about a warm-up, like the words are right there, like warming up. You're trying to prepare your body to move. And so to do that, you want to do something that's going to be specific to that. So doing a stretch and hold doesn't prepare your body to move. <laughs> Whereas sense. doing wrist circles and elbow pivots and shoulder circles and things, that's actually moving your joints through their range of motion, warming up the tissues, um, getting your blood pumping. So literally, you know, increasing your circulation, a little bit of body temperature rising, making things move better, more malleable, lubricating the joints, things like that. So movement before you're going to move. Yeah, that makes <laughs> so sense. So dynamic, yeah. So dynamic stretching before you play. Um, during a show, any time you can shake something out, do a couple rotations, whatever it is through the show, will help you offset some of the effects of those repetitive movements and postures and things like that. So that those are always a good thing. Um, and then uh, after the show is, or rehearsal, because you should be warming up during for rehearsals too, um, after the playing session is when you want to do your static stretching. So you finish playing, you walk around for a bit to bring your heart rate down, regulate your breathing again. And then that's when you want to do those stretch and hold. Um, And you want to hold the stretches for at least 30 seconds per position, um, preferably even up to 60 Mm. uh, for your major muscle groups. Yeah. So um, that helps again with cooling down. But at that point, your muscles and tendons and ligaments are all warm from having moved. So they're most receptive to actually stretching at that point. And so that's when you might get some gains in your flexibility and range of motion um, by doing those stretch and hold. So that's dynamic great. stretching to warm up and static stretching to cool down. Yeah. The easy way to remember that is, is dynamic to go and static to stop. That's all, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. how they work. Cool. Mm-hmm. Any more questions for anybody and in the meantime can you talk about anything you're working on now yeah um so we still have uh the energy expenditure and heart rate study um during live performances so i actually just had data collection last night um this was a fun one because it was it was chuck como from simple plan cool and he did the study Four years ago, he was actually one of the first people I had in. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we did two data collections when he was out on Warp Tour. The last year they ran it as like a full like North American tour. Um, and so we got his numbers. And then he actually was in Windsor for a show last night. So he, you know, offered to do it again. And so we thought it'd be fun to see, you know, what's changed in four years. Um, so that's fun. Got that one still going. Good. And uh some stuff in the lab. Um, so still looking at vibration exposure during playing um, to see how it compares to the, the industrial standards for exposure mm-hmm. in the workplace. Um, and then the uh, drum instructor interview study is the one I'm, I'm yeah. probably working the most on right now. How's that yeah. going? What are you finding? Any Anything so far enough to report on as far as a ratio of how many instructors, I have a feeling I know what the outcome's going to be, but about how many instructors do or don't teach their students these things and, and the why for either one? Yeah, so I actually, um, so it, it's going well. I yeah. had I interviewed 12 uh, independent instructors. So these are instructors who teach either through their own studio or as a private instructor or even at a music school, like a, a guitar center or something like that. Um, but the, the idea here is that they're an independent essentially. Um, so I interviewed them, all 12 of them said they teach their students about injury prevention, Wow! which I was on the one hand, obviously happy about on the other hand, I'm, I really wanted to capture people who don't and the reasons why they don't. So I'm, I missed out on, on that aspect, but I can't control who volunteers for the study. I put it out there if that's right. who volunteered. And I'm guessing, so, and I'm not saying this is the answer, but I'm guessing, and this this might 
trickle to why you're not getting responses from them. I think one of the reasons they don't is they're, believe it or not, unaware. They're unaware that it's a thing, you know, and therefore they, oh, there's that. And then they don't want to be the ones to tell on themselves and say, nope, haven't been doing that. Why not? I didn't know about it. You know what I mean? That yeah. could be an element. I, I think that, um, I, I think you're right about that. I think there are, I mean, based on my survey and how many people said that they were not, so 80% of that 830 drummers, 80% of them said they had taken drum lessons at some point. Only 40% of those uh, said their instructor taught them anything about yeah. injury prevention. So clearly it's not happening as often as it should, but I, I get why I had hoped I would have gotten volunteers to, to come forward and talk about it because it's so important and yeah. I know people value it. Um, but I, but I didn't, but I still got some really interesting insights from the ones who did, because we did still talk about like the, the challenges to teaching this and how to incorporate it into your curriculum and, and things like that. So I still got some pretty neat insights about it um, that uh, I do plan on publishing at some point. So I'm, I'm in the Good. final stages of the analysis for that particular group. So Good. they didn't teach it when I took lessons, but that was so long ago. But they also <laughs> didn't talk about hearing protection. I do remember the fishbowl on the counter at the music store. And there were these, these packages of, you know, pairs of earplugs. And my mom said, oh, do you want to try these? Sure. So I tried them and I just could not play with them because it was like someone having their finger stuck in my ears and I couldn't yeah. hear frequencies. I couldn't tell dynamics as much. So I stopped using them. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never used them. And consequently, my hearing's not that great. And I remember when I used to do a lot of session work in the 80s and 90s, I'd, when I was in the studio, I'd have to have one ear slightly peeled off, just enough to where it wouldn't bleed into the microphones enough, because there was something almost like claustrophobic about it. And no matter how well the mix was in my headphones, I had to have it, had to hear the sound in the room. Then mm -hmm. I had a student a few years ago who I could not believe how hard he was playing. And he was like nine years old, really just smashing stuff. And mm -hmm. he was wearing the sort of, they look like they're for the firing range and maybe they are. I said, let me see those. And I put them on and I said, and I told the dad, I said, okay, if he plays for just like 20 seconds. Yeah, sure. He played and first of all, he couldn't believe how loud everything was. I couldn't believe how much I could not hear it. It was like being underwater mm. and hearing someone playing a radio on the surface. It was so stifling of the sound that it was making him play as if he was chopping wood or something. It was just, yeah. so people got to be careful with that little, little side note, if you will, um, yeah. relating to how things were different back, back, in, <laughs> back in my day. We didn't talk about injury prevention. <laughs> you know, we didn't even know what was caused from drumming, for goodness sakes, you know. Yeah. Um, so I hope you do get some participants that are open enough to say, yes, I teach drums. No, I don't talk about drumming injury and whatever the reason why. E even if it is, I didn't know it was a thing. That's okay. There's mm -hmm. nothing to be embarrassed about. You don't know. No. Dr. Nadia knows because she's got a degree in kinesiology and she's a professor at the University of Windsor. So it you know, <laughs> give yourself yeah. a break, guys and girls that teach that don't know that stuff, you know? Absolutely. And and that's why I was I was hoping to catch them because I really want to know what do you need in order to be able to do it? To teach. Or to do it. Yeah. yeah. Or, or to do it better, um, which I did get a lot of that from the cohort I did interview. It was like, yeah, I, I do this and it's very important and I do all these things but I'd like to know more. I'd like to know better. I'd like to know more detail. Right. Um, you know, so I, I did get a lot of that, which is good, but I do really, yeah. Why, why aren't, for those of you who aren't, you know, why aren't you? Is it because you were never taught about it? So you didn't know it existed. And now that you do know, you don't know where to find good information. Um, you know, is it, is it because you work in a place where they tell you what you can and can't teach? And so you don't have time to teach uh, it? I don't know. Yeah. I'd yeah, like to know Yeah, because there are other factors that could come into play. I didn't think of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Absolutely. Uh, you know, and actually, so I'm still trying to recruit people uh, who teach drum set at in more structured educational settings like a post-secondary uh, drum performance uh, degree program or in a high school, like a high school music program, but they, you know, teach mainly drum set. I don't know if that, I don't think that's a thing in Canada, but it might be in the U S yeah. Um, I think if because, it's like jazz band and things like that. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I want to know, you know, are there differences due to the organizational structure in which your lessons take place that either limit or maybe facilitate, you know, uh, NASM, uh, National Association for Schools of Music, has been incorporating injury prevention in their, uh, you know, recommendations and policies and things like that for like 20 years now. So I also, I thought I might hear from one or two who were like, yeah, I have to teach it because it's part of the university's curriculum. And even if I didn't want to, <laughs> I have to do it. Yeah. You know, so what are those things that either help people do it or not, or, or keep them from doing it? Right, um, exactly, and, yeah. Yeah, and I think that will be different depending on the setting that they're in. Um, that so that's that's what I'm trying to find. So you you should make shirts with your logo that say, "Doctor Nadia says if you teach drums, you're not a weenie for not teaching. If you don't know, you don't know. You know something like that." My shirt <laughs> yeah, says, "Yeah, relax. The drummer is here. It's a Drum Talk TV shirt, folks. You can get it at DrumTalkTV.com." My, um, my wife says it's quite ironic that you wear that shirt from time to time because. What if the drummer's not relaxed? Like, then what? What do you do if that person's not relaxed? <laughs> <laughs> They're supposed yeah. to show up and everyone goes, oh, the drummer's here. Okay, yeah, everything's cool. <laughs> <laughs> no more questions, folks. Don't be shy. If you're curious about anything drumming injury related whatsoever, whether it's your story, something you heard, something you read, a friend of yours, a relative, let us know. Ask questions while we've got Dr. Nadia Right here, professor of kinesiology. For those who don't know, what does kinesiology mean? Is it the study of human body at autonomy and anatomy, autonomy, anatomy, motion? And, and is that what it is, basically? So, yeah. So broadly, it's the study of human movement there you go. Um, yeah. from multiple perspectives, from, you know, the anatomy, which is just the structure of the body. The physiology is how it functions. Um, you know, the control, how you learn movement, how you control movement, the mechanics of movement, um, all those different things. And in multiple different contexts, whether that's, uh, you know, babies learning, like, you know, developing into full grown humans versus athletic performance, I'm still working on that, music performance <laughs> the first one. versus, you know, performance and how, how your, your body and your movement changes as you age and what goes into that and why. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a huge field with lots of, uh, you know, sub disciplines within it. And my, my sub discipline is the biomechanics and ergonomics. Awesome. How can people get a hold of you if they do want to participate in these different studies that you're doing? Yeah. So the best place to hear about the different studies that are going on is through my social media. So whether that's Facebook or Instagram are the, are the two main ones I'm on. Um, my handle on both is at Dr. Nadia Azar, doctor as in DR, so DR Nadia Azar. Mm -hmm. um, and they can also email me at the University of Windsor. Uh, so my email is my last name, Azar, the number five, at uwindsor.ca. That's my work email. So they, a lot of people reach out through there um, to find out what's what's happening. Yep. Great, so, great. That's awesome. Yeah. There's no more questions currently, so perhaps over time you can just check in on this, see if anyone's leaving any questions or comments and answer them. Otherwise, sure. folks, go out, go ahead and reach out to Dr. Nadia and be part of her studies. It's very, very intriguing stuff. There's a lot more to drumming than just, I hit something, it goes bang. You know, there's a lot more to <laughs> it than that. <laughs> so thank you Definitely. for joining us, everybody. Dr. Nadia, thank you so much for taking time and joining me here on Drum Talk TV with Drumming Injury Talk with Dr. Nadia. We'll see you all soon. Lots coming to Drum Talk TV, folks.